we're back. We're, we're live. We're here on Friday, and you know what that means? Likeable science. Okay, my co-host down at the far end of the table there is Ethan Allen. He's the original Mr. Likeable Science. <laughs> Hi, Ethan. Hi, <laughs> Joining us today is uh, Kevin Kelly next to Ethan. He, he, he's uh, EPSCOR, director of EPSCOR, did I get that right? Executive director of EPSCOR. Managing director. Thanks. Managing director of EPSCOR. And uh, I'm going to leave it to Ethan to take a moment, I mean, Kevin, to take a moment and tell us what that stands for. EPSCOR stands for the Experimental Program to Stimulate Competitive Research. Your microphone. It's a program that started the National Science Foundation maybe 25 years ago uh, to really help states become competitive nationally in research and education. Okay, we're going to take a minute. We're going to take a minute, if you don't mind, m m uh, program manager person, uh, and we're going to have a short break till we uh, fix the mic, mic situation. Okay? Aloha, yeah, person, and a happy new year. I'm your host, King Zilli. From inner city out to the platform and now on the Yaf Show. It's a new year, and most would say a new beginning. So this is a call to action. As we promote tech, energy, diversification, and globalism, with Think Tech Hawaii, the Yaf Show is all about advocacy for effective leadership, comprehensive youth policies, programs, and access to knowledge and information for upward social mobility, especially for the historically underprivileged youth this means we'll be looking at young people making a difference in their community. Youth policies here in Hawaii, the country, and the world. We want to highlight youth programs that are meeting young people where they are, working together to accomplish a goal or tackle an issue, while providing information and access to free educational content for anybody looking to learn on their own time, study for an exam, or simply refresh their memory. We do this by inviting everyday people like yourself state policymakers, youth advocacy groups, youth programs, professionals, and so forth. But most importantly, we'll be partnering up with my new organization, CauseEffect.org. More information on CauseEffect as this website is currently in development in the hopes to feature courses, seminars, tutorials, and conducting surveys that will be featured on the show. As we leave behind 2014, I wish I could say we leave behind issues such as police brutality, youth violence, education, economic mobility, and so many other hot-button topics that made 2014 a difficult year. So what does it mean for the new year? What does it mean for youth policy? What does it mean for the Hawaii as a whole? And most importantly, how does it affect you and your community? We want you to tune in to the YAF Show at 3 p.m. Friday and find out. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're all mic'd up, okay? And we had just learned that EPSCO stands for the Experimental Program to stimulate, stimulate, competitive, stimulate research. competitive research, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. I knew you'd say that. The <laughs> well, National there, Science Foundation. There are other agencies in government that have EPSCOR and EPSCOR-like programs. Uh, USDA, uh, NASA, NIH has a big one called Embry-Cobra that UH participates in also. So it, it, again, it's a program across these agencies to build competitiveness in, in less competitive states and jurisdictions. Okay. Okay, we're going we're to find out more about that and how it works with uh, John, John Rand, who is the uh, director, interim director uh, of the uh, STEM education program at UH, and that means it covers all of UH, right? Correct. I'm uh, with the University of Hawaii system, so we, uh, we are a 10-campus system, and we've, uh, this position that I'm in is brand new, and uh, we're basically trying to uh, kind of get ourselves coordinated and, and see if we can get a lot more energy generated as we work together as a system. Okay, uh, welcome, welcome to you guys to our show. Thank you, Jay. Uh, so I want to get a handle, you know, on what the, what the status quo is right now. How are we, you know, that is, you know, before your STEM directorship began. Uh, what, because you only came, what, the last 90 last, days? Well, no, that last year. But, last year, yeah. okay. Um, so, you know, where, where is it now, sort of in a snapshot way, uh, and, and, you know, how, how does it look? Give us a picture of it. STEM well, around the university. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we have um, two campuses that are sort of emerging resource, uh, research campuses at the University of Hawaii at Hilo and the University of Hawaii at West Oahu. We have a stellar uni uh, university community college system. And then we have a, a large kind of research facility, uh, one of the greatest, uh, in my opinion, in the world. And um, so we have a really wonderful system of schools. And we've really, 
uh, done a great job, particularly at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, making that into a world-class institution. Uh, I think we haven't done as good a job telling everyone about the world-class education that you can get at UH, all throughout the various colleges. And I think that's partly what my job will become, is to, to try to build on that, um, build on, on not just the research that we do at the university, but the wonderful education you can get and the, the kind of student learning that happens there. So let me, let me understand it. It's not the research per se, which is pretty good actually around UH. There's some pockets of brilliance for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's the fact that we are educating kids and, and we want to make sure they get properly educated so that they would make uh, career choices to become researchers and get in scientific research. Right. And, and that's that, where, that's where that you can are. happen really early on in your yeah. career. Um, you know, we, can, we need to balance uh, bringing in talent from other places to, to keep us you know, on the cutting edge while at the same time uh, growing our own research base here in the, in the state of Hawaii. And How so does, I think those two things have to blend. Is, are you reaching down at the high schools also um, in some way, I mean, so even in, in the way of recruiting for UH uh, seats? Yeah, we are clearly. Uh, in, in EBSCOR, for example, we've had programs that reach down into elementary schools with math education uh, through Kapilani Community College in particular. Uh, and you see these kids coming up through high schools and junior highs, and you can follow them along and see their math scores in those, in those schools jump. Uh, and now we have some of those students actually graduating from KCC and entering UH Manoa as, as undergrads. Yeah. So the, word, the foundations have been laid. We have a good process. It's really growing that out so that we can take advantage of that in, in all our neighborhoods in the state, in the state, because we do have a good system. So you guys are, I'm making a wild guess here, you're collaborating. Ooh, yeah. Can I get that right? <laughs> we do. <laughs> how, how does that work? Well, I think that um, uh, it's a really important to have close contact between what's happening in the research institutions and what's happening in research and then and what's happening in student learning. And I don't think we should forget that um, part of your education is research. Research and education are not independent of one another. You're, you're, you know, we're training students to be great world-class researchers. And, um, you know, one, if you look at the strategic directives of the, the university system now, there's really very clear language about how we want to try to develop pathways in, in STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, that will really start in probably in the middle schools and then begin to move students through. And we're trying to design systems to have very specific pathways, uh, kind of meta majors, if you will, even at the two-year colleges who don't typically have majors. But as students uh, in STEM become a uh, part of something, they feel like they're becoming part of a major, even though we aren't specifically in a major, they can begin to participate in, in these really wonderful programs that are going on at, at the four-year institutions. And I think those kind of really integrated and strong pathways um, are a very, very powerful uh, retention strategy that the university is adopting. And I think you're going to see that grow in a very big way in the next, in the very near future. And, and EBSCOR really helps out that way too because at the National Science Foundation, EBSCOR is the only state-based program. It's the only program where money really goes to look at the advantage of, of the state, look at the challenge the state has. And so as a result, the money that comes into EBSCOR, it, it funds research, yes. But it also connects a lot of other pieces, whether it be communities or in our last EBSCOR award, uh, Chaminade University played a significant role. And they contributed just in ways that we couldn't imagine before. And so it really helps bring not just the system together, but the state to address uh, resource needs or workforce needs. And we really try to target that research and outreach and education activities to meet the needs of the state. On a community level, how important is this? And, and I'll preface that question by telling you about my lunch with the, the mayor, the vice mayor, it was, of Beijing. I said, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, it's great to have lunch with you, you know. And um, I said, it's, it's amazing that in China, 29% of all college graduates uh, are, have specialized in engineering uh, in their college uh, program. And it's quite remarkable, and it's good for the country. You know, I was stroking it. Okay? He said, well, thank you, Mr. Faisal. That's very nice of you to say that, but it is not 29%. It's 59%. Oh. 
Wow. <laughs> do we do we have that going here? I mean, I, I sense that somewhere in the, in this in the program you guys are talking about, it's the idea of getting there, of getting to higher numbers of kids who study both in uh, mm -hmm. you know before college and college engineering and science and math and all that. Well, I, I can. Um, in part answer that, I mean, I spent a, a number of years at the UH Community Colleges, at Capulani Community College. We had a STEM program there that was sort of formally uh, developed using funding, again, from the National Science Foundation, including the EPSCOR funds. And that program, for example, in engineering, we received a grant there called the Pre-Engineering Education Collaboration, where we, we collaborated uh, with a number of community colleges as well as the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And we moved the engineering numbers from approximately 24 students to over 400 students now. That That's are doing, impressive. To the point where uh, it's impressed upon the College of Engineering that they need to begin to really rethink what their numbers are going to look like here and how they're going to uh, figure out uh, how to adapt to the, yeah. the huge number of students that are potentially coming yeah. in. And a big part of this is providing students the opportunity to get on a pathway where they can go to community college, they can address remedial math, which is a big problem in Hawaii, and either jump out with a two-year AS degree and find a job doing something, a technician or, or applied engineering, or they can move on to UH Manoa or Hilo, one of the four-year campuses, and not lose credits and not have to repeat courses and, and move on to another degree. And since they've instituted some of these AS and as associate science, natural science, and engineering degree pathways at the community college, as John said, those numbers are, are escalating rapidly. It's a, it's a shorter, more efficient path to higher education and hopefully better jobs. And also the path is, is going to be designed, and, it's, and we all feel, I think, very strongly that there will be places, inroads, and places to get off the path, go into the workforce. Uh, there are a lot of middle skills jobs that are very, very powerful and are very, very important to a state in keeping a state afloat that are very, very needed in the computer science industry or in, in engineering technologies and so on. That, and so you can kind of get off the path and then kind of reestablish yourself back onto the path if you need to do that. And we're trying to build into the path these transition points, uh, these pinch points where, where there's very specific funding going to be aimed at trying to get students who are interested in getting a workforce job to get them out there to be, get them gainfully employed and then if they decide well I need more education or I'm, I'm excited about moving to the next level they can get back in and start to move and I think that's something that has been missing but is very very important in developing this new idea of, of the path. Amen to that I'm shaking my head because I um, two things one is uh, uh, in another trip to China I found one of my lessons was that these kids in China they go to take a program in college, they go out in the workforce, they come back into college, mm -hmm. they go out in the workforce. It's a stepladder kind Absolutely. of affair. And they you know, always keep you know, their training in mind, they're always working. And the money they save while they're working, they spend for tuition when they go back exactly. in. Exactly. Very compulsive, but gee, it, exactly. it raises all boats. And then you have a, a nation that is better trained. College is a lot easier when you don't have to work and go to school at the same time. Yeah, um, I think a lot of us have been there on both sides of that, and that's admirable. I think you know, but we come, we've come from a culture, and a lot of the kids now are still still in the culture of you go to school, you pay your dues, you're done. Right, right, and they don't think of this this rotational thing you talked about, John, which I think is so important. I mean, we don't have enough outreach college going on. We don't have enough of this rotation going on. If we want to build a really skilled STEM workforce, you know, which is, at the, you know, the end of the day here. Um, that's what we have to do. We have to give them those pinch points that we're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Distance education is going to become a viable option. Uh, we know students do not learn the way we learned when we went to school. I'm, I'm going to assume that. Yeah. But I, you know, the whole concept of going to a university, living at the university, and studying hard until you're done, and then you're done, that's pretty much gone. Sixty-seven yeah. percent of all students in Hawaii come in through the community colleges now. Uh, so they're not all just following the same plan that you and I are. And that number is probably going to be increasing big time. Well, a short story on that one I wanted to tell you is one of our camera people, operators here in ThinkTech, uh, came out of the Navy. He had the GI Bill. I guess they Perfect. still have a GI mm -hmm. Bill. 
He went to, he is going right now to one of the community colleges, study engineering, and his plan is to lateral over, or I'm not sure how that works, but he goes from uh, his program's engineering program at the community college directly into the college Absolutely. engineering, right. and then it's like nirvana for him because he's he's going to be a real engineer and is starting out with, you know, only his Navy background. That's something. Well, there's something interesting that's going on, too. You know, uh, I don't have the data, the most current data, but in the, pa in the very recent past, the largest growing community at the community colleges was the four-year students coming back to the community colleges to take courses. Huh. They're less expensive, and they articulate directly to the four-year courses. And so the, that was one of the biggest segments of growth that we were experiencing at the community colleges. So I think the students are seeing the worth of that kind of, 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 of easy transition and articulation between schools here in Hawaii. And we do it here in Hawaii, in my opinion, better than most in the country. It's really amazing how we are able to develop that articulation so strongly. There are a lot of students co-enrolled at a community college and a four-year campus in our system. Was that right? Yes. And multiple community colleges. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, how do you do that? So that's, that's hard work. Course offerings and price of tuition. I can take history to community college or, you know, I can take my upper division in Manila where it's more expensive. So where, where do, uh, you know, online courses, uh, you know, fit in all of this? And, and I, you know, I, I wrote an article once about MOOCs. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, I, and I said to the university, I said, <laughs> Two MOOCs. I don't know what happened, so tell me what's going on. <laughs> well, the MOOC world uh, has lost a little bit of steam. Uh, I think they're still trying to figure out what the business model would be with MOOCs, and I think that's probably, it's a financial driver more than anything else mm -hmm. that, has, uh, that has slowed MOOCs down. Um, distance education, you know, at, in, in particularly in Hawaii, I mean, with the islands, is, is very real. I mean, you can't, if you can't get a Calculus three course on a neighbor island, then you know we have to try to f solve that as, as a university. If we don't have enough students to fill a class on Kauai, for example, then it's our responsibility to figure out how to get, because you don't want to say, well, no engineers can come from Kauai. That's just the wrong answer. So uh, for us, it's a no-brainer here in Hawaii. I mean, we've got to do some of the work that we do by distance education. We need to be innovative in how we deliver the courses. They aren't going to be just uh, videotaped courses. They are actually interactive. Um, you know, so there's synchronous and non-synchronous delivery. We're, we're adopting both. I think we've, we're finding the best of both worlds. And in some ways, I think Hawaii's being a pioneer in distance education because of the need that, that's a, here. A tremendous need, and, uh, you, know, and you know, it solves the problem that one hears about, namely these kids, even in Manoa, can't get into the course they want. Right. So if you set it up as uh, an online or semi-online or whatever, uh, then you're not only solving the problem for the neighbor islands, you're solving the problem for the kids right here. You can get the course. There's really no limit on how many kids can participate, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the other thing about that, uh, it, it strikes me, uh, is that um, it, it, it extends the educational experience to everybody. You know, you can take them at night. Um, you can take them on the weekends, right? Of course, yeah. it depends what model you set exactly. up. Exactly. Right. And, and that's still in process, right? You, right. You know, because there's so many ways you can do it. I wanted to tell you about David Ige. David Ige came to this table, this one, right okay, here. and he had two statewide conversations he did with us. And he sat here and he, he made his, uh, his educational or his political statement about what he was, wanted to do. Um, and then we had uh, Live Shift with University Project Product, you know. By right. Alex uh, uh, Virgo, um, and um, so he called for questions, and they asked him questions, and he answered. This is statewide, right? Because mm. we're live streaming, um, and then he asked them questions using the same technique, and they answered the questions, and you could see their answers in a graphical way. Right. So he was in really engaging with hundreds of people at a time. It's interesting from a political point of view, but it does suggest there are ways that you could engage in one of these online courses and have the same benefit, it really is if you had a student right there in front of you. you know, even in live courses now, we're introducing technology into the classrooms because, again, students don't learn the same way. They don't sit and listen to a lecture and take notes and come back and take a test on it. So there's, there are interactive tools, there's ways to take polls, there's ways to ask questions that, that we never thought about in you know, the last 10 years that have come around. So you really have a carte blanche here, John. I envy you. We I, all do. I, yeah, okay. I envy myself. <laughs>
you know, I mean, you can you can figure it out, and you can figure it out again and again and again. You can make well, a wonderful it, life. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. I think there's a lot of um, you know uh, forethought that was put forth by the UH administration, and so on, to realize that we do need to develop the STEM education side at the at the university system because I think there's a lot of benefits that we can we can really. Um, we can look at the national models, for example. I mean, there's so much going on nationally that oftentimes we're out here in Hawaii and we don't get plugged in. But when you have someone that's kind of forced to look at all the issues and look at how distance education and hybrid courses, I think it was the word you were looking for, hybrid courses are being used, which have become extremely popular. You know, how do you do research or teach research in an online setting? You know, can kids do a research project at home? Uh, can we do laboratory science on, on, in a distance environment? I mean, there's a lot of folks that would say no, a lot of folks that say yes. It's a great time because there's a huge national debate going on. You know, could we send a box full of cool stuff back, you know, back home as a biology 101 student and allow them to have the same lab experience that they have in a face-to-face -face class? Uh, I don't know that we know the answer to that, but maybe we'll come up with something brand new. You know, completely novel, but it's a very, very exciting time. Yeah, take advantage of resources that are out there. For example, the science fair. You know, it mm -hmm. reaches uh, seven thousand kids around the state. It's a high school thing, but if you know, and they get mentors, of course, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you know, they have a lot of um, interaction about it when they come to Honolulu. Uh, for the a lot of UH judges too. <laughs> a lot of UH judges. <laughs> for years it's it's a great community mm -hmm. service. But it strikes me that you can have a course that that wraps into something like that. And it could happen, on, it could be uh, online, and it could have the brick and mortar of an outside experience, a neighbor island experience, where there's a competition going on. Another competition, yeah. somebody else's competition, but the course, you know, connects with that. You know, that's a changing face of research, even at Manoa, is that, and actually nationally, is, is engaging students in younger and younger age in real research, hands-on research. Mm -hmm. uh, engaging undergraduates in, in doing research and writing papers and, and understanding the, the philosophy behind hypothesis and testing questions. Uh, it, it's really captivating to a lot of students and it gets them to open their eyes to like, I used to think science was kind of nerdy and, um, and hard. And you get kids to do it and, and they, they don't know they're quite doing it. Going, this is pretty fun. I'm in the stream here sampling this water. I understand why I'm doing it. Um, and, and KCC, for example, is using it to, uh, again, apply math, get kids up to standards in math. You want to tell them about that, John? Yeah, they, there's a summer bridge program. This is one of those pinch points, you know, mm -hmm. and we think of them almost as a transition center where they're moving from the, the high school experience into a college experience, and we want to give them a leg up, so we oftentimes will invite seniors into a STEM program, a bridging program. And basically, and I probably shouldn't say this on TV, but... Uh, it's a math thing. We want to get their math. As hard as we can push, we want to push them to calculus because there is no STEM major where calculus isn't going to be forefront for what you need to learn. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of students need some remediation to get to that point. And so uh, we basically bring them in and we have these wonderful experiences. Uh, I think this past summer, they, so they would take two to three uh, hours of mathematics every morning and they learn it in their own way. They'd use the My Math Lab, My Math Lab which is kind of a software program that they, they use, and um, they, they're doing their own math. We provide all kinds of support services and resources. There are faculty available to do mini lectures. There are peer mentors available. There are videotapes, <coughs> lectures, all kinds of resources. And YouTube. And, and YouTube. <laughs> yeah. and the Khan Academy. We aren't the using Khan that, Academy, but yeah, Khan yeah. Academy. There's a program called Alex. They can use any of these resources, but they've got to get the push to calculus. And once they... And, and we can start them at all different levels. And they actually have, have had tremendous achievement. The uh, success rates in, the, in that very first transition uh, bridge was over 70%, whereas normal success rates for students can be in the 30% or lower. It's great. And so, you're looking at the whole state, you know, as a, you know, a sort of a large, comprehensive picture, right. trying to see all the corners of it, all the issues. So we're about to take a break, Ethan. But before we do that, I want to get your reaction to the discussion so far. Uh, what, what are the high points as far as you're concerned? Well, I see that this is really beautiful stuff because, as you say, it, it, it helps marry education and research, brings, gets students involved in doing authentic science on a lot of different levels from very early stages on up through the, their graduation. 
And that keeps the students much more engaged, keeps them learning at a deeper level, keeps them uh, really involved as a professional almost, even, even as a student, um, that they really understand what, what STEM is all about now. So I think, I think it's super. Okay, we're going to come back and talk about uh, my, my question to you will be, where does confidence play in all of this? And I'll tell you what I mean. It's about some of these guys that finish the science fair, that win the science fair, and they go to the mainland and get you know, uh, scholarships to MIT, whatnot. Um, and it's all about, for them, it's all about confidence. So uh, where does that play? And the other thing I wanted to ask you about is the hackathon, which oh. is coming up this weekend, because we need to know about that. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, Archival Science. And uh, our uh, regular host is here, is my co-host, Ethan Allen. Um, and we have uh, Kevin Kelly of EPSCOR and John Rand, who is the interim director of STEM education at the whole, the whole university. <laughs> How do you sleep at night? Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Andrew Howard. I'm an astronomer at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii up in Manoa. I'd like to tell you about the annual open house that we're having this year. It is on April 6th, 11 to uh, 4 p.m. It's an all-ages event, kids, grown-ups, even uh, people in between. Everyone is welcome. We have a lot of uh, really fun activities. You get to meet astronomers, look at yourself in an infrared camera, play with Legos, make robots, look at videos. Um, you can even make it. Some of the kids like to make comets out of uh, gravel and, and, uh, and snow. Even adults like to do that, too. You'll be able to look at the sun with a solar camera uh, safely. It's really a great activity. We do this every year um, in April, and I hope uh, to see you this year. Thanks. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Kevin Kelly, EPSCOR, uh, John Rand, the Interim Director of STEM Education at the entire university. That's the second stop on the, on the freeway, right? We're, we're going to cover this in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Ethan Allen, our regular co-host in Likeable Science. So to capture what we were talking about during the break, the university, people really don't know the depth and, and, and breadth of the university. Can somebody tell me just exactly how big and how depth and breadth it is? <laughs> well, we do have 10 campuses in our system. And, and each campus operates independently. They each have their own chancellor. Um, they have slightly different missions. The system has its own mission. and and how things are executed on each campus are, are actually very unique to the needs and wants of the communities that they're located it's a good in. Thing. It is a good thing. It is a good thing. And actually, if you go to the, the hawaii.edu website, the main UH system website, uh, you can look up all the different campuses and they all have the same UH logo, but each campus has a different color of a logo. So oftentimes there's confusion between UH system and the UH campus and the community college. Sometimes people don't think even the community colleges are part of UH. Uh, so it is sometimes confusing, but we are. We're very unified and more and more streamlined 10 campus system. Let me take a whack and say that the color of the logo for UH Manoa is green. Got it. Good that was easy. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about confidence. You know, and I'll tell you my orientation on this. Uh, one fellow especially um, uh, did well in the science fair. And uh, he was from Hilo young kid, a Japanese kid, uh, modest, you know, shy. Uh, he wins. He gets a scholarship to a big eastern school. He does well there, comes back, uh, goes to medical school, comes back, and well, now he's a practicing physician, doing very well. And sta he, stayed with, he stayed with the science fair all these years, all these years, devoted to it. But he, what he says is, I, I would never have achieved the confidence necessary to go to the mainland and get into and deal in, in a big school, do research and science education without somebody telling me, yes, you can do this. And that's got to be part of what you guys are talking about, yeah. isn't it? You've got to find pinch points, maybe, where they get the message that, yes, they can do it. It's not above them. It's, it's theirs to take. I, I agree, Jay, and I'll, I'll get hit the bottom here before John takes over some STEM talk, but um, you know, young kids, just to teach them about being curious about the world, getting them to ask questions, and then figure out that they can actually answer them by doing things. Right, um, in preschool. It, exactly. It's, it, it just becomes a curiosity-driven thing that 
if, if done when kids are young, just becomes a way of how they look at the world. Uh, but then you get into school and, you know, math is hard and, and science is strange and, you know, there's peer pressure to, you know, read People magazine um, instead of Nature. So, you know, those things start interfering. So it is important to, to capture young minds and have them become curious about what's around them. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the adage, uh, knowledge is power. And I don't think that's, I think that's very real. Um, and I think that you learn that probably the most strongly when you do research. Because in a science fair or in research, you're actually doing something that you're sort of on your own with and maybe no one's ever done before or has have never thought of it in this way and all of a sudden you realize I'm doing something here that's very significant that might even be able to contribute and that is very very powerful and I think it it builds confidence uh, exponentially as you said you know you can sit in classes and you can and you can uh, take courses and you can do very well you can get straight A's and so on that builds confidence of course unfortunately not everyone can do that you know but for the middle third if you have the opportunity through a, something like a science fair or an undergraduate research project where you can do something and go, wow, you know, that, that's something that not a lot of people can do or haven't done, um, I think your confidence goes through the roof. Yeah. Or, or even be part of a team that's doing it. A right. team doing you know, those, that's more and more what we confidence. do. Right. Yeah, right. And those are the kinds of experiences that then build into workforce skills, the so-called soft skills that, that really the team. Make, make it yeah. in life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Much we more so than getting right. on tests. Robotics is a great example right. of that. Right. We've had wonderful success in robotics, but you're engaging artistic kids and engineering types and, you know, computer and science. science. Computer. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different disciplines that goes into that team that makes it happen, right. which is like I said, extremely right. valuable in the workforce. And you bring the students together and you say, okay, there's a competition, here are the rules, what are you going to do? And you'll find it's amazing. They will begin to organize themselves as an engineering, <laughs> as an engineering firm would. Okay, yeah. you have folks have talent in there, that's got to be done by this state. And you, it's amazing, you go in the meeting and they're like, Guys, you've got to have that done because I can't do my thing until you. And, so and Bobby's going to do that because we all know that's what he does. <laughs> yeah, he's good at it. Yeah. Yeah. And then he builds right, right, right. his confidence. So yeah. you know all these skills working, you know, from the ground up. I, I went to a, a, a an unconference last weekend. It was called right. a sustainably sustainable unconference. You talk about following the rules, and the rule for those guys was there are no rules. Okay. If you want rules, make your own rules. And the, each, of the, each of these groups, they made different rules about how, what they were going to do and how to discuss it and you know, how they're going to reach their, their goal. I think it's very interesting that, that um, it's part of the process, the social process of collaboration, right. if you make, you make your own. The other thing I, I wanted to ask you guys, guys about was uh, the hackathon. There's, there's a parallel, I think, in some way between the hackathon and the science fair because they all have to get you know, together and uh, they're... As you mentioned, I, I wasn't aware of this. There's two sides of the hackathon. One is when you hack, you're hacking somebody's computer system, and the other is when you're trying to defend against that. And so this is really testing your ability to understand larger computer systems and security issues, which are so important now. I mean, every day they're more important. And I mean, Hawaii needs to be expert, and it's like everywhere else. So uh, you know, what about that? Where does that fit in, in the picture of STEM education we're talking about? These are kids in this hackathon thing, even though they're staying up late at night. <laughs> well, I, this, is, this is a really fantastic program um, that was put together um, by, uh, in a collaboration, again, uh, with uh, the University of Hawaii at Manoa and the Computer Science Department. Um, well, Philip Johnson's involved, yeah. I think Gerald Lau from, is one of the principal oh, yeah, okay, developers. Okay. And, um, and some of the community colleges as well are, are very, very involved. Um, and then we also have a relationship with some of the folks down at the harbors uh, in particular, because the focus of this particular hackathon is what would happen if someone were, there was a cyber attack on the harbor systems. Uh, so the United States Coast Guard and so on are, are involved. So it's really a blending of industry and, uh, in, in this case, military and, and the university. And it's wonderful. There are teams that are formed, and, and they have to try to figure out how to get into the big service systems. And we've got dummy service systems that are very, very similar to the servers that, that are being used out in the environment. I mean, they're actually, you know, the, the, the actual servers that they're going to go after. And then there are other teams that are formed that are the cybersecurity teams, and how do you deal with the hack minute by minute? So it's almost like, here it comes, what are we going to do about wow, it? Wow, so exciting. It's, it's thinking on your feet, it's doing things. 
And uh, quite frankly, there are a lot of students out there, very young students, that are very, very tuned into this stuff. They know what this is about. So without even calling yourself a STEM major, they might be very, very interested in what's going on this weekend. Well, you know, it's a, to me, this is part of the Carta Blanca thing, you know. You see these things happening. The thing about being in an island state is that you're not necessarily moving at the same pace that the mainland does. And you, you can get sloppy and do nothing. Then you it's at a different pace. <laughs> or you can be better than the mainland. And it's always possible in an almost naive way where we can be better. We can achieve, you know, we can, we can have a complex about you know, achievement, and then we can achieve better than anyone else does. And, and it's possible here, and we can develop a, a STEM-educated generation, if you will. I think it's just waiting for that. Really committed, really excited about STEM. Mm -hmm. And send, I, I don't want to say send them forth, because we want to send them forth and have them come back. <laughs> but, you know, develop a whole generation of people who are specially trained, specially motivated. That's what you're sitting on, John. I think that there's a lot of opportunity, and we are the gateway to the East. So in cybersecurity and so on, we are not a minor, minor player, and we can't rest because I think we're going to be one of the biggest players in the Pacific, quite frankly, in this area. I mean, we have to be. I think that if we don't, we're going to be in big trouble in our financial institutions and health institutions and, and security institutions in the military presence here in Hawaii. Um, even even in a fiber-connected world, there is some advantage to being physically isolated. Yeah, yeah. true. Yeah. You can learn. Yeah. But, you know, talking again about that isolation, what about drawing people, students, and faculty mm -hmm. in from outside? And, uh, you, know, I, you know, we've heard so much about the actual research and about, you know, the grant writing and, uh, and, and appearing in the pubs and all that um, and making careers. We have that. We, I mean, I think we have a lot of that. But query, what about the ordinary faculty guy who wants to teach kids? And what about the kids who come from somewhere else who want to come and be taught? Um, can we draw them? Can we become a magnet that way? Are we doing it now? I don't know. I, th I think we are doing it now. Um, we could probably do more, of course. I mean, it's a very attractive location. Uh, but you know, our areas of expertise, uh, people do come here from marine science. They're drawn here. We, Asia Pacific studies, they're drawn here. Astronomy. Uh, we have undergraduate programs in Hilo now uh, that are attracting students. And I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, again, this interaction between top-end researchers. I mean, these are globally recognized experts, world-renowned kinds of people. You can come as an undergrad and, and really get face time and participate in some of the research that's going on here. That's really going to be uh, one of the major stimuli for the pathways that we talked about earlier in the program. Um, I mean, there are some things that we do extremely well in Hawaii and probably better than in most places, and, and yeah. Kevin mentioned a few of them. But so we're thinking of, you know, pathways like food, water, and energy. Oh, sure. So we can do things in, in an island community that others can't, and, we, and water is very important to us, and we get it in a very different way than others do. And the energy requirements that we have, very, very different. Everybody knows all about the energy questions. But then, there, you know, biotechnology, th there was a push for a lot of years, and there still is at some level, to have a very strong biotechnology. Based on program. the diversity so, of the population. Yeah, that mm -hmm. might be a, uh, a pathway. Then, of course, you've got your life science and physical sciences. Engineering is a big one. IT and data science. A new one is data science. Yeah, that's yeah. a new one that has emerged, and that's part of this whole cyber, this, this whole cyber piece. So I think if we're smart in developing STEM education, we will look at the very significant pathways where we've made inroads and that we want to develop. And as we strengthen the pathways, we'll strengthen the STEM workforce. And and we've been deliberate course. about that in the past. I mean, KCC, when they were developing the first pathways, it was in life sciences, right? Mm. In natural science and life right. science, because there was a lot of students going from community colleges into nursing, for example. They said, well, we need to streamline this pathway. And then engineering was the next one. And, and they've, they've been thought well, and they've been executed well. And so again, we're looking at new pathways, again, like data science. This is really important to the yeah. future of the state. Right. And again, these are driven by state needs. Uh, this, this isn't what the university, oh, we have some people who are really good at this, let's do that. It's like, where is industry going in the state? Where are the economic drivers in the state of Hawaii that we need to build a workforce for? or that we need to create industry around yeah. to take advantage of those, of those opportunities. It also provides kids and regular people with a, a different view of the world. If you understand science, you understand the world. 
and, and that changes the quality of your life. Yes. Well, right now we're seeing even in, in data science, if, if you're a biologist and you know how to write scripts and code, well, well now you have an, a, a leg up on a lot of kids, especially when it comes to genetic information and bioinformatics. Uh, you know, the, the same is true for geologists. If you can write code and start looking at, let's say, earthquake data in a different way as an undergrad, uh, you have a leg up. And so the intersection of, of these, these different disciplines is becoming more and more apparent at early and earlier stages in people's careers, if you can cross over and understand the way somebody else thinks. Well, uh, we're almost out of time, and uh, Ethan, I wanted to ask you to do a summary of what, what you took away, <laughs> what you think we should take away from this discussion. And when he's done, I'd like to give you guys some camera time to talk Ooh. to the parents of the kids. <laughs> Who, who are, you know, who are the ones we are ideating to, all right? So, Ethan. Well, I, I think this really speaks to the trend of thinking about science in a very big picture way and realizing that it's not an isolated activity that occurs just in someone's laboratory, just hidden away at some university campus, but it is something that everyone is involved in all the time. It ties to our everyday lives in multiple meaningful ways. We should get training early on in it to learn, to enjoy it, to be enthusiasts of science, and such training will inevitably pay off in deeper engagement with science in all the scientific fields and higher academic achievement, uh, better lives in general. So uh, that, that's what I, what I take away. You guys, you guys are pu pushing for a very good thing. Yeah. We're not Thanks. asking for much, but a better life would be right. okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. More money. <laughs> okay, talk to the parents. Uh, Kevin, why don't you go first? What, what would you say to the parent there? You know, who could affect the decision his child will make? You know, make math fun. Math is, is really, a, it's a do or die thing in science. Um, but be supportive. You know, kids don't all like science. And, um, you know, be supportive of what they like to do. Technology is great because it crosses everything now more than ever. Uh, more than anything, support what they're curious about. John? I think that um, you need to push to calculus. Uh, there's no question about it. If you if you want your student to be or your your child to be involved in STEM, no matter what they're going to do, even in the middle skills level, a push to calculus, even if you don't get to calculus, is the right path. Don't take three three years of math. Take four years of math. I mean, you, that's an option for you, and you really ought to do that. So get yourself there as quickly as you can, and then uh, you know a, there are a lot of resources at your schools that you can. Uh, tap into and the students need to have as many opportunities as they can it's not necessarily critical that a student knows how to build robots when they get out of high school that's not necessarily and that's kind of a sad thing to say that's not necessarily the skill set the university requires but you do need chemistry and you do need biology and you do need some of the basic sciences those are so very important so it's not all about being specialized, at least at the level in, in high school. We're going to provide that training for you at the university. Okay, these guys want to want to make Hawaii a center of excellence. So let's let's work with them. Thank okay. you, John. Thanks for having me. Thank us. you very thank much. You, Kevin. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, John, and and thank you, Ethan. Thank this you. is uh, likable science, of course, and we've been talking about uh, a um, a pathway for STEM at UH in general. Thanks again. <laughs>